Um, so network protocols. <laughs> the, nothing makes sense. Um, um, you know, the, nobody would have designed what we have today. It's just kind of a mess. And if you just kind of get at it, trying to read the RFCs and everything, making the assumption that things make sense, it'll just drive you crazy. And the way that it's usually taught is as if TCP IP arrived on tablets from the sky and it's awesome perfection. And, um, you know, nothing else ever existed. But, um, you know, I don't think you can understand things that way. So it helps to know how we got here. And, okay, rant about standards committee. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's a cue for me here, not, not for the reader of the slides. <laughs> so um, the, um, I'm always curious if there's two things that are similar, like InfiniBand and Ethernet. I want to get to the heart of what are the conceptual differences. And nobody else seems to do that. If I ask someone, you know, either people know A or they know B. And if you ask an expert in A how it compares with B, they'll say, oh, A is awesome and B sucks. And <laughs> you get the opposite answer from a B person. And then as the industry, you know, engages in mudslinging, if the A people realize there's things about B that are better, no problem, they steal the ideas. So both A and B are moving targets and they don't really care what's inside their spec. They just want credit for it. So um, it's natural to think of um, standards bodies as well-educated technologists that are carefully weighing engineering trade-offs. But a much accurate, w more accurate way to think of them, I claim, is as drunken sports fans. So rah, rah, my team. <laughs> so um, layer two and three stuff. Uh, so why do we need both Ethernet and IP? And networking experts will say, oh, well, well that's easy. Um, everyone knows that IP is layer three and Ethernet is layer two. C answered. Um, <laughs> but what does it actually mean to be layer three versus layer two? So first we need to review network layers. So um, this is in all the network books. Um, ISO is credited with naming the layers, and it's just a way, a way to think about networks. Um, you know, no one takes the layering very seriously. They, um, you know, implementations look at things from other layers when, you know, that's layer violation. And, um, but it's a good way to start to think about it. So, whoops. Um, so what's important for this talk, layer one is the physical layer. It sort of says what the shape of the connector is, how you signal a bit to somebody who's on the same wire as you. Um, layer two is the thing that takes the stream of bits that layer one uh, provides for it and somehow frames the packet. It says this is the beginning of a packet, this is an end of a packet, might include a checksum. Um, Whereas layer three is the thing that has these components that you can call switches or routers or bridges, whatever you want, that forwards packets from link to link to link to find a path across the network to get to the destination. So what layer is Ethernet? Um, Ethernet was intended to be layer two where everybody was on the same wire, um, but we're forwarding Ethernet packets. How did that happen? Um, we weren't supposed to. <laughs> it wasn't designed to do that. So um, these boxes that forward things between um, links, I claim they should all be considered layer three. So, because that's what layer three does. So um, back then, um, the, you know, I guess it was the 1980s, the routing protocol that I designed for DECnet, um, it can work with any layer three protocol and it's still widely deployed for routing IP. Um, ISO adopted it, and they unfortunately renamed it ISIS. So, um, you know, like, I don't know, six years ago or something, Trump claimed that Obama and Hillary invented ISIS. And a few of my friends... <laughs> <laughs> A few of my friends noticed that and forwarded it to me, saying, shouldn't you get some credit? <laughs> so anyway, what's a routing algorithm? So routers exchange information with their neighbors, and they compute a forwarding table. So um, this thing 
um, switch a router or a bridge, I'm going to use the terms interchangeably, receives a packet, looks at something in the header, m most likely the destination, has a forwarding table that tells it for each destination which port to forward it out. So the thing I did was link state routing. And so, um, you know, a quick overview of that. Here's a network. Um, there's seven nodes in the network. And you can see that A and B are neighbors because there's a line there. And the six says the cost of the link between them. Um, each node is responsible for creating what I call a link state packet, which says um, who you are and what the state of your links are to your um, neighbors. So in this case, it says, I'm C. I have a neighbor B at a cost of two, F at a cost of two, and G at a cost of five. And each one of these guys uh, generates one of these, and it gets flooded to everybody. So everyone has the identical database, which is the most recently generated link state packet from everybody else. And that gives you enough information to draw a picture of the uh, network or to figure out paths from yourself to everybody else. So um, um, back to history. So I was innocently designing layer three. Then along came Ethernet with great fanfare. So um, the original Ethernet was a way for a bunch of nodes to share the same wire. So um, there's no, they're all peers. And if two guys talk at the same time, then um, they garble each other's transmissions. So, you know, it was a clever um, algorithm for, um, a clever and simple algorithm for making sure that you can somehow talk, even though you don't know whose turn it is. So um, the algorithm is known as CSMACD, um, uh, where CS stands for carrier sense, which just says, you know, be polite. And if someone else is talking, don't start talking. MA just says multiple access. There's lots of nodes that share the same wire. CD is collision detect that says that even while you're talking, you listen to see if someone else starts talking so that, um, you know, you will both stop and start again a random time later. I'm sort of always amused because I seem to have been born with CSMA CD. It's sort of what I naturally do. Um, but if you go to a conference room, you'll see that not everybody is following that. So, <laughs> yeah, some people raise their hand, which is like no one's there to call on you. Um, and at the other... <laughs> And at the other extreme, some people do the collision detect, but instead of stopping, what they do is start talking louder. So at any rate, um, <laughs> so if you try with this algorithm, if you try to load it with more than 60% traffic, there's too many collisions and um, the useful bandwidth goes down. Um, and it's limited in terms of the number of nodes, like maybe a, a hundreds of nodes and the physical distance. So it's okay for within a building, but it wouldn't be an appropriate way to hook together the internet. So um, Ethernet addresses. So this is kind of weird. Ethernet has a six-byte address, but it only needs to identify nodes on a single link, and there were only like a few hundred nodes. Why would they choose a six-byte ID when IP had a four-byte address and was intended to hook together everything in the entire world? So... <laughs> um, um, so the reason is that it eliminates the need for users to configure addresses. The uh, concept is the manufacturer who is going to plug to uh, build equipment to plug into an Ethernet has it born with a unique ID, and um, you know they were um, assuming and um, that six bytes would be enough for that. Um, so yeah, from uh, again ranting. Um, why is this called an address? To me, an address is something that if I move, it changes. And <laughs> your Ethernet address doesn't change if you move. So it, it shouldn't be called an address. It should be called an ID. And then calling it a MAC address. How is that helpful? I even know what MAC is. But, you know, like actual human beings have to listen to you. So why are you saying that? <laughs> So anyway, um, I saw Ethernet as a new type of link. Um, you know, I was doing this routing algorithm, and then I saw Ethernet where suddenly um, you could have 500 nodes on the same wire, and the link state database would get much larger if everyone reported all 499 of their neighbors. So 
um, I did little things that I didn't think were profound enough to write a paper or whatever. Um, um, so I, I did the concept of a pseudo node where um, in the link state algorithm, if you're connected to an ethernet, instead of reporting all of your neighbors, um, you model the ethernet as kind of one extra node, which is the pseudo node, the ethernet itself, and everyone reports connectivity to it. And uh, one guy sort of gets elected to speak on behalf of the ethernet and reports connectivity to everybody else. So instead of having 500 squared links, you'd have uh, um, and 500 nodes, you'd have 501 nodes and 500 links. So, you know, little things like that. Um, but Ethernet was a link in a network. It's not a network. I wish they had called it Etherlink. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, if you look at an Ethernet packet, a destination and a source and data, and a layer three packet, they look kind of the same, um, except for this hop count field. So what's the hop count field for? Well, if the topology is changing, the forwarding tables will be inconsistent and you'll have temporary loops um, uh, while the topology settles down. So it's you know really irresponsible to be forwarding something that doesn't have a hop count. Um, you know, yes, you can do trapeze without a net, but but why? So um, anyway, it's easy to confuse Ethernet with layer three because it looks kind of the same. Um, but Ethernet has flat addresses instead of um, addresses that are carefully assigned so you can draw a, a circle around a portion of the net and summarize it. Um, um, and there's no hop count field. And it wasn't because the Ethernet designers didn't know about hop counts. It was because it never occurred to them that anyone would be foolish enough to be forwarding based on that header. So how did Ethernet evolve from CSMA CD to spanning tree? So people built applications on Ethernet. So when Ethernet was the big thing, people were building applications without layer three in the network stack. And so I, I said, hey, hey, no, no, don't do that. You still need layer three. And they said, oh, Radia, you're just upset because no one needs your stuff anymore. And <laughs> I said, but you may want to forward from one Ethernet to another. And they said, our customers would never want to do that. So, <laughs> we, um, you know, you can't just put a router in there. It can't forward unless it has kind of the end node cooperates. So um, the applications that they built were good and they made lots of money for the company. And so they were real heroes. Um, but the applications would have been just as good had they done it properly with layer three in the end nodes. Um, so I was in a bad mood about all this with those people <laughs> being heroes. Um, and then my manager called me in one day um, and said, Radio, we need to design a magic box that will sit between two ethernets and let someone over there talk to someone over there, which is what my stuff <laughs> did. But the constraint was without modifying the end nodes, because we've already deployed them, there were no spare fields in the ethernet header and there was a hard size limit. So um, they, they already had sort of the basic concept, which is to have this thing that just listens promiscuously, listening to every single packet. And when the ether is free on the other side, or if it were a token ring, when it got the token, then it would forward onto, onto that port. Um, and, but this requires a topology without loops because, um, you know, if, <laughs> if there were loops, it would just keep going around. And worse than that, with layer three, you only forward in one direction. Whereas with bridges, you, if you have five ports, you'll forward onto all four of them. So every time you forward, you're making four, uh, copies of the packet. So not only do you have an infinite number of iterations, you also um, are multiplying the number of copies at each app. So what should we do about loops? So um, one thing was, hey, this is just a quick hack um, until we have a few months to fix the end notes to put layer three in there. Um, and so we should just tell the customers, don't make loops. And I had some, <laughs> I had some, sympathy with that. Um, 
But loops are not bad. Um, it means there's backup paths in case something fails. So um, there was a desire to, um, you know, as, as my manager said, oh, you do distributed algorithm stuff. Um, why don't you figure out some sort of loop pruning algorithm that with zero configuration and no rules on the topology, you just plug it together and um, it, they figure out a subset of the topology. And he thought it was going to be really hard. Um, um, he said, um, oh, and just to make it more challenging, um, make it scale as a constant. So no matter how many uh, how big the network is, no matter how many bridges and links there are, the amount of memory necessary to run this should be a constant, which is a ridiculous thing because nothing's a constant. You know, linear is sort of the best you can do. Um, it's probably going to be n squared. So um, at any rate, I'll tell you this story. I'll continue that story in, in a bit. But um, so what the loop pruning thing does is you have some physical topology plug together, you know, however you want. And um, then the spanning tree algorithm runs and the, um, oh, the blue things are ethernets, the black lines are ports and the round things are bridges. So some of the ports the bridge has decided is, um, is redundant in this topology, which means that they will not forward packets um, to or from those ports, but the port is still alive for running the spanning tree algorithm. Um, and so the path from A to X, if A transmits a packet, it'll follow the, the um, path with the red lines. Now you might think, well, you know, that was not a very smart spanning tree algorithm. If you had a smarter algorithm, you would have a better path. But no, I mean, if you have a single loop-free subset, someone's going to be unhappy. If you imagine the topology being a big circle, a uh, spanning tree has to break it someplace and the people on either side have to go around the long way. So everybody knows that Ethernet is wildly successful. Um, and I hear things like, um, you know, like when they, right, when that sports team gets together, they talk about, boy, it sure is lucky the industry didn't go with that silly token ring or token bus way of sharing a link. <laughs> um, but wired Ethernet, you know, like within a year or two after, you know, spanning tree bridges, um, CSMACD uh, died. This original invention doesn't exist anymore, um, you know, except a variant on wireless links. But um, it became um, spanning tree with point-to-point -point links. So there were no more shared links. So um, Ethernet today has nothing to do with the original CSMA CD Ethernet invention. Um, there's no need for any clever way of sharing a link. So the saga of the spanning tree algorithm. So the manage my manager asked me this on a Friday afternoon, and then he left for a vacation for a week. So, um, <laughs> and this was before cell phones or email. So um, there was going to be no way to get in touch with him until he came back the following Monday. So he said, oh, do this thing that's probably impossible and then make it scale as a constant. So <laughs> that night I realized, oh, my goodness, it's trivial. I know just how to do it. I could prove it worked. And it scaled as a constant. The reason it scales as a constant is if you're a bridge, the only thing you need to do to run the spanning tree algorithm is remember the best spanning tree message you've heard on each port. So um, when you're receiving packets, you look at it, you say, is it a spanning tree message? And if it is, you compare with the one you have stored and whichever one is better, you, you throw away the worse one and you keep the better one. Um, and um, a spanning tree message is about 50 bytes. So that says if you have seven ports, it takes 350 bytes to run the algorithm. So, um, you know, I was very excited. And because this is the world's most trivial algorithm, um, uh, I was able to write the spec in two days. So at the end of Tuesday, the spec was sufficiently complete. Um, it was about 30 pages. Um, that the implementers got it working in just a couple of months without asking me a single question. So, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And IEEE somehow managed to take the spec and make it incomprehensible and like 300 pages long. But at any rate, <laughs> so um, anyway, um, so now it's the end of Tuesday and I couldn't do anything else the rest of the week because I was just like, um, you know, too excited and I had to show off and he wasn't around. So, <laughs> um, so the way I spent the remainder of the week was working on the poem, which is the abstract of the paper in which I published this. And um, um, so I officially spent more time on the poem than inventing the algorithm and writing the spec. <laughs> so um, the poem is called Algorithm because every algorithm should have an algorithm. So. Um, I think that I shall never see a graph more lovely than a tree, a tree whose crucial property is loop-free connectivity, a tree which must be sure to span so packets can reach every LAN. First, the root must be selected. By ID, it is elected. Least cost paths from root are traced. In the tree, these paths are placed. A mesh is made by folks like me, then bridges find a spanning tree. <laughs> And I asked Chat GBT to write an, um, a six stanza poem about it, and it did a really good job. I was sort of, <laughs> it was nothing like this, but it was also would have been perfect. But anyway, <laughs> so um, at that point, um, there was the implementers were saying, "Look, it's just a, um, you know, the, this bridge thing is just a quick hack until we fix the end nodes, and then we can do proper layer three routing." And I had some sympathy with them. Um, I did want them to implement this because, you know, once you've <laughs> written a poem, you really want it um, deployed. Um, <laughs> so um, at any rate, I let management, because they wouldn't believe me if I tried to argue. Um, so management told them, nope, you have to add the spanning tree algorithm. As trivial as it is, um, um, it, it does add complexity to the basic concept, but you have to do it. And then once they sold the very first bridge, I realized, ah, yes, uh, management was right to force them to do that. Because the very first bridge was sold to the world's most sophisticated networking customer at the time. So the story I found out later on was that they were saying, um, you know, the sales guy said, um, buy one of these things, it'll just work. And all they wanted to do was connect two ethernets. So um, they were saying, oh, but, but we're doing all these innovative things with this and that and whatever. And the sales guy said, oh, it'll just work. And they said, oh no, we need to talk to the engineers. And the sales guy said, no, you don't. So, <laughs> so they plugged it together and it didn't work and they were so angry. And when field service came to figure out what the problem was, they realized that the world's most sophisticated networking customer with the world's simplest topology had done this. <laughs> so it was working because the bridge said, I don't seem to need to forward packets, so I won't. <laughs> but if you ever need me, I'm here to forward packets. <laughs> and I was really glad I thought of this case. So at any rate, um, so it was right to, to do that. And I don't know why bridges are uh, have a um, setting where you can turn off the spanning tree. Um, I mean, I sort of understand because there's this one thing that everyone kind of hates me for, which is that temporary loops are really, really scary. So... Um, and it takes a while if the topology changes for the new, um, you know, uh, new topology to set in. So um, you can't just click your fingers and everyone simultaneously change. So I put in a timer, which is a parameter. If you're feeling lucky, you can change it to something else. So the, um, it's 30 seconds. So um, people don't understand if all they have is two ethernets and two bridges connecting them. If one goes down, it takes 30 seconds for the other one to come up. And they say, oh, well, the spanning tree algorithm is so slow or something. It's, it's just to prevent temporary loops. Um, but at any rate, 
Spanning tree ethernet is a kludge. You don't get optimal paths. Um, links that are not used are underutilized um, at, that are not in the tree. And temporary loops are incredibly dangerous. Um, so why was bridging so popular? Well, originally there were lots of layer three protocols. There was lots of IPX and Apple Talk and IP and DECnet. And so you would need, if you wanted to interconnect nodes running these different protocols, you'd need lots of different routers. Or they did sell some multi-protocol routers, but they were super expensive and really slow. So bridges just worked and they were cheap. Um, bridging was zero configuration. You know, just plug it in. Um, as a matter of fact, um, some, you know, some people complained at me that some, uh, um, some of their customers were unhappy because they really liked to fiddle with things. And this was the most boring product that digital ever had. Uh, <laughs> so, um, um, but the fact that we had bridges, why didn't they go away? Um, is that bridges helped IP become more tolerable and lets us live with IP for longer. And I'll talk about why that is. So why do we need both the Ethernet and IP? So why not just get rid of Ethernet and use only IP? Because the original uh, problem was that they didn't have layer three in their stack. But now everyone has layer three in their stack. And furthermore, everyone's agreed on IP. So why not just hook the world together with um, IP routers? And um, on a link with just two nodes, why do you need this header that has a six byte source and a six byte destination. If there's only two guys on the node and you hear a packet, it's for you, <laughs> you don't, right. <laughs> um, so um, why can't we just forward things with layer three? So if IP were designed differently, we wouldn't need the ethernet header anymore. So um, there were other layer three protocols that could have done all the link forwarding with layer three. and Ethernet would have gone away years and years and years ago. So what's wrong with IP? Well, IP is very configuration intensive. If you move a node from one side of an IP router to another, it has to change its layer three address. But that's just an idiosyncrasy of IP. So, um, you know, every link where a link is what is perceived by an IP router to be a link um, has to have a unique block of addresses. So routers need to be configured with which addresses are on which ports. And if something moves, its address has to change. So um, you wouldn't be able to have a cloud like a data center with a flat address space where you can move things around and have them keep their layer three address. So um, you know, with each link having a different address block, if you move from one side of an IP router, you have to change your address. Now, layer three doesn't have to work that way. So this is something I really want you to kind of assimilate. So there was this other protocol done by a different sports team, with, um, and it was called CLNP, Connectionless Network Protocol, and it had a 20-byte address. Now, um, the top 14 bytes was a prefix shared by all the nodes in a large multi-link cloud. And um, so the prefix allows you to get to a cloud instead of a single link. And once you're in the cloud, then you route based on the six byte um, bottom port. So inside the cloud, um, the nodes have to sort of let the routers know where they are. So there's an extra little protocol where they say, hi, I'm here. And the routers let everyone know where the end nodes are within the cloud. Um, so that was an extra protocol known as ESIS. ES is end system, IS is intermediate system. So um, basically, um, with the 20 byte address, the 14 byte prefix allows you to get to a cloud and you can have as many levels of hierarchy as you want, just like with IP. But instead of terminating on a single link, you terminate on a cloud and then you route specifically to the end nodes inside the cloud. So um, if you're doing IP plus Ethernet, um, IP lets you get to the destination what um, the router thinks is as a link. And then you have to do something like ARP in order to um, get the address within the link. And um, then the 
you need some other clues to kind of disguise a cloud as a single link to IP. So like spanning tree or trill or um, CSMA CD or VXLAN or something like that, that you would like to um, make something larger than a single link. So with CLNP in contrast, the top 14 bytes get you to a cloud, then you don't need to do ARP because the rest of your address is still inside your address. And then um, inside you can have true layer three forwarding with optimal paths and hop counts and all that. So um, with CLNP inside the cloud, zero configuration of the routers. You just plug it together and everything works. You have to tell at least one router what the 14 byte prefix is. But other than that, there's um, nothing that needs to be done. So <laughs> the worst decision ever was that in 1992, people said, you know, IP addresses are a little bit too small if we're really going to try to interconnect the world. So why don't we adopt CLNP? which is this 20-byte thing. It's widely deployed. All of the major router vendors had implemented it. So why don't we just do that? And somebody um, um, ported TCP to work on top of CLNP. And so with basically, and it, it took them only a few weeks. And um, then at that point, um, with, you know, very little effort, all of the internet applications worked on top of CLNP. Um, and it was so much easier to move the internet back then. It was really small. Um, it wasn't mission critical where you have to do everything on the internet. And IP hadn't yet, out of necessity, invented DHCP and NAT, which we'll talk about um, in a bit. So CLNP gave understandable advantages. It's like, hey, with this thing, zero configuration. Oh, well, that sounds good, because back then, IP, you had to configure every single node. Um, and CLNP is much cleaner than IP because of this concept of level one routing, which is the routing within a cloud. Um, so why didn't they adopt CLNP? Well, um, you know, they almost did. And all the leadership people were saying that's what we should do. But a few very loud um, people objected very loudly. Um, that's what loud people do. And, <laughs> and so they were saying that would be ripping the heart out of the internet and putting in a foreign substance. Well, there's nothing less compatible about CLNP than IPv6. So that was, you know, a very weird thing to say. Or we don't like ISO layer six. And it's like, that has nothing to do with whether we should adopt this 20 byte format. Um, or, well, and uh, yeah, or we're not immediately out of IPv4 addresses and we are brilliant. And all of the other sports teams are just total morons. So. I'm sure that given a little bit of time, we can invent something that will be so much better than CLNP. So um, why don't we just give ourselves time to do this incredibly innovative thing and we'll win Nobel Prizes and all that. So um, the decision was let's do something new and call it IPv6. So IPv6 is just a 16-byte version of IP where the yeah, the top eight bytes says um, what the prefix is, and the bottom eight bytes is node ID on that last link. So eight bytes on the bottom is way too big, especially um, because afterwards they invented DHCP, where you know three bytes is enough, maybe you know maybe four, and um, eight bytes on the top is inconvenient for trying to globally allocate blocks of addresses. So, um, and it's technically inferior to CLNP because it doesn't have, uh, you know, you still need to have something else that will disguise um, a, a cloud to look like a link and you need something like ARP in order to get the address on the cloud when you get to the last link. So, now I'm going to talk about some good stuff that might not have happened if the industry had made the right decision. 
So the first thing is DHCP, um, where how does an end node get a layer three address? Well, with CLNP, you just stick your ethernet address into the bottom six bytes. Um, but with, and so they're kind of assuming everyone has an ethernet address. Um, whereas with IP, you had to configure absolutely everything. Um, and then they invented DHCP. So with DHCP, you have some sort of server that has a pool of IP addresses that um, are consistent with being on what IP perceives as that link. So um, the node comes up and it broadcasts and it says, hey, is there a DHCP server out there that can give me an address? And the DHCP server says, you can have this IP address. So what's cool about this is you don't need six bytes for your address on a link. Um, addresses can be smaller or the top part can be bigger. Um, and then there was something that, you know, came up years later that people were saying, oh my gosh, um, if your ethernet address is in your layer three um, address, then if you're, you know, traveling someplace, um, if someone can look at the source address, look at the six bytes, say, oh, I know that's Radia's laptop. Oh, she must be in, you know, Europe this week or something. So um, they didn't like that. So uh, with DHCP, it's a dynamically assigned address and you wouldn't get that. Um, so certainly you could have used a DHCP to get your address in CLNP, but would anyone have thought of inventing that given that it sort of worked fine? Um, and the other thing, everyone loves to hate these, is NAT, Network Address Translation. And what that is, is there's, um, you know, there just aren't enough IPv4 addresses. So there's a block that um, anyone within their own network can use. So the same addresses get used in lots and lots of little networks. Um, so of course, you can't use those in the internet. So um, you have this private network with addresses that are not meaningful outside. And you have this net box that has a pool of um, internet meaningful addresses. So um, if someone inside tries to talk outside um, because it has a globally um, understandable address for, for the server it wants to talk to, uh, the NAT box um, assigns it, uh, you know, with, without anyone needing to know anything, this NAT box just sort of does it. Um, and so it assigns um, the source a globally um, understandable address and it changes the source address on the way out and on the way in, it replaces the um, destination address with the locally meaningful source address. So what's cool about NAT is you don't, there's no way to talk to a node inside your network unless it talks first. So um, that is an important security thing. Um, and certainly NAT would have worked with CLNP, but again, because there was no shortage of addresses, would anyone have thought of inventing it? So um, some other protocol observations. So parameters. Um, I hate computers. <laughs> um, as a matter of fact, I'll tell this story. I am not a hands-on person. So in a sense, I don't you know, belong here because you guys all are. Um, and to show how um, not hands-on I am, um, we have, our landline depends on the internet and about every week or two it stops working and there's a voice activated fix, which is I say, Charlie, can you reboot the router? And it gets fixed. So <laughs> I have a Charlie. <laughs> and um, then another piece of the story is that um, the realtor who sold the next door house uh, just happened to mention to me that the people moving in had red interconnections. So they were sort of excited to to move there, um, to move next to me. So um, about a year and a half ago, um, and uh, Charlie is fine now, but um, he tripped or something and fell face first into concrete. So um, it was serious. He doesn't remember the accident at all. Um, you know, lo uh, some broken bones, uh, lots of stitches, a subdural hematoma. So I took this lump of stuff into the emergency room and, um, and, you know, I'm not any good in emergency, so I was a wreck. 
and they wouldn't let me in because of COVID, but they said, uh, just go home and we'll call you with an update. So I got home and the phone wasn't working. So the voice activated fix wasn't going to work. So I knocked on the next door neighbor's uh, door and I said, um, do you know how to reboot a router? And the guy said, didn't you invent those things? <laughs> <laughs> But then he realized I was upset, so he came into the house and he said, where is it? And I said, I have no idea. <laughs> so he just looked through the house for things with blinking lights, unplugged it, plugged it, got it working. So at any rate, I'm not a hands-on person. <laughs> so I design things for people like me, and when people complain that customers found it boring, I said, fine, if they want knobs, I can put in knobs. <laughs> but you won't have to touch the knobs. And even if you do, any setting of the knobs will still work. You might be able to tune it or something. And that's a good philosophy when you're designing things. So parameters. Um, if you have to have parameters, of course, there should be a sanity check uh, when someone types it in. So if the only legal values are between 10 and 20, don't let them configure it as 537. But sometimes, a and B both have reasonable settings, but they won't interwork. And this is um, something that, a concept I was never able to explain to my otherwise bright college age son, which is that there's no such thing as a reliable, I am dead now message. So you have to periodically call your mother. <laughs> And there's an opportunity for a parameter mismatch, which is how often you call and how long she waits before panicking and calling the police. <laughs> so in ISIS, in the, um, in the get to know your neighbor you know, protocol, um, um, I called it the hello message, I put in the hello timer. So I, um, you know, the way you get to know your neighbors is you say, hi, I'm Radia expect to hear hellos from me every 30 seconds, and your neighbor multiplies it by three or something. So then um, later on, when um, the internet people decided they wanted a link state protocol too, um, and someone said, hey, just use ISIS, and they said, oh, we want to invent our own. So they basically mostly copied ISIS, made it more complicated for no good reason, and um, they noticed the hello timer, in the hello message, and they put that into OSPF too, but they didn't quite understand the purpose of it. So in OSPF, when you receive a hello timer from your neighbor and it says, hi, I'm Radia, expect to hear hellos from me every 30 seconds, what the OSPF spec is, you compare that value with your own configured hello timer, and if they're not identical, you refuse to talk. And I've been giving them a hard time about this for years, and they say, well, they think that way is simpler or something, but it makes the network very brittle because why shouldn't you have, and if you ever try to change the value of the parameter and whatever. But anyway, um, <laughs> so now I'm going to talk about theory versus practice. So um, secure communication on the internet. We've solved this. We have perfect crypto. We have perfect protocols. Let's say, you know, TLS is wonderful. Um, you know, everything else about it is wonderful. So, um, you know, when you use HTTPS, you can be assured that everything is secure. So um, um, here I was, <laughs> I got caught in a scam, but oh yeah, um, so yeah, here's the theory. <laughs> the client um, wants to talk to x.com. So you uh, say, hey, prove your x.com. x.com sends a certificate with all sorts of cool crypto. And then you have a cryptographically protected conversation. Problem solved. So now, in reality, a user doesn't usually start with a DNS name. They, why should the user automatically know the DNS name of the thing they're talking to? So um, instead, you do a search and you get some sort of obscure URL string. So that's a URL string. A human should never see anything like that. That's an actual URL. Um, so even if the user manages to find the DNS name in the URL, um, you know, I fell for a scam. So I wanted to renew my Washington State driver's license. I knew it could be done online. 
And so I did an internet search for Renew Washington State Driver's License. I clicked on the top listed site, which is always the right one. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, right, it didn't occur to me that that would be the wrong one. Now, as it turns out, I didn't notice that it said add, but, you know, lots of times the right thing also pays and it's, you know, whatever. Um, but if I had looked at the um, DNS name, I don't remember if I did, um, it was a perfectly reasonable looking DNS name, you know, WashingtonInformation.org driver's license renewal. So um, um, I clicked on it and everything was as I expected. You know, there you could click on renew your license, get a new license, and look how happy the people in those pictures are. <laughs> This couldn't possibly be a scam. So <laughs> I clicked on Renew License, and it asked me everything I expected. It asked me my address and my license number and my credit card number, and success. I, I got that chore done. And I would have thought nothing of it, except probably a month or so later, I would have wondered why I didn't get a new license. But the criminals that put up this website were too greedy. So they charged $3.99 the first day, $9.99 the second day, $19.99 the third day, at which point the bank fraud department called me and said, are these legitimate? And I figured out what must have happened. And um, they said, okay, and they disallowed the charges and they gave me a new credit card number. So I was not harmed at all, but it gives me such a valuable ex um, example that there's zero security on the internet because we're assuming that users somehow magically know the right DNS thing. So um, um, don't blame the user. I hate hearing things like, we need more user training, or um, you know, users shouldn't click on suspicious links. It's like, what's a link? What's a suspicious link? And um, you know, I don't click on attachments. If there's a Word document or a PowerPoint document, I should be able to open it. It might give me seen pictures or something objectionable, but it shouldn't infect my machine. So, you know, it should just be something that puts pictures on my screen. So, um, yeah, the, in this case, the scam sites appeared first, either because they paid the search engine um, company or they um, know the ranking algorithm and they can set up false things to all point and they can be first. And um, this particular scam had several different names like DM, WashingtonDMV.org um, and for all 50 states. So also IdahoDMV.org. So um, this particular scam has been shut down now, which is kind of a shame because I wanted more screenshots and... <laughs> And um, yeah, it's gone away. Um, but at the time when I realized it was a scam, um, I had no way to report it. So the search engine thing should have a way of saying, I'm reporting this to be a scam. So, you know, I didn't know what else to do and I felt like I should protect the world somehow. So the only thing I could think of was, I know Vince Cerf and he works at Google. So I sent him email and I'm not sure whether he did anything about it, but you know, I'm, uh, it has been shut down. So the site I should have gone to, that was the DNS name. Again, I am a human. Why should I know that? So um, yeah, departmentoflicensing.washington.gov. And someone said, well, you should have known it would be a .gov um, top level domain. It's like, no, <laughs> you know, I claim I'm a human and I shouldn't need to know that. So, um, oh, and this is a quote from the security book that when I wrote it, um, I said, yes, that's exactly right. People should memorize this. And I've seen it on quote boards. So yeah, I'm very proud of this quote. Humans are incapable of securely storing high quality cryptographic keys, and they have unacceptable speed and accuracy when performing cryptographic operations. They're also large, expensive to maintain, difficult to manage, and they pollute the environment. It is astonishing that these devices continue to be manufactured and deployed, but they are sufficiently pervasive that we must design our systems around their limitations. So, yeah, the lesson is 
you need to look at all the components of a system. You can't sort of focus on polishing, you know, the message formats or something. Um, you, you know, don't get mesmerized by just looking at the cryptographic algorithms and stuff. And in this case, the faulty assumption is that the human knows the DNS name to go to. So, um, as well as knowing how to find the DNS name inside this bizarre URL string. So another thing to rant about, hyped things. So blockchain, <laughs> you know, got really, really hyped. Everyone was talking about, well, that should be like one of the pillars going forward of technology or something. So it's, um, what happened? It started as the technology behind pit Bitcoin. People made money on Bitcoin. The more they hyped it, the more money they made. Um, and startups leveraged the hype to claim their product has something to do with blockchain and the money rolls in. So um, after hearing so much hype, it's natural to assume that blockchain must be important. So there's lots of talk about how it's being considered for this or that. And that should be sort of a red flag, you know, like look for articles where it say it is successfully being used for such and such rather than it's being considered for. Um, and there's so many variants of it with so many different properties, it's no longer clear what blockchain is. So an assertion that I heard um, was distributed identities using blockchain solves the identity problem. And so I thought, really, what do you think the identity problem is? What do you think blockchain is? And why do you think it's helpful? So um, that's another whole talk that I have. Um, um, so one way of thinking of blockchain is a magic thing that solves everything, especially if it's security related. But a more realistic thing is it's an append-only database, world readable, stored and maintained by lots of anonymous nodes very expensively. So um, distributed identities using blockchain. I've simplified the concept down to what it is really conceptually. Let's see. Okay, I'm almost done with the talk. I'm not sure why I threw these slides in. I think because I was so mesmerized by this thing. Um, so um, the distributed identity thing, it's this huge spec with these really complicated syntax for these things. But basically, there's a initial part which says which blockchain you got the name from. And then the rest of it is some string which is the name that you choose. So what you do is you look at the blockchain, look for a string that no one else has claimed, and then you can put that string and your public key on the blockchain, and now that is the name that you get. So, um, um, and each namespace, you know, um, has its own blockchain. So within the namespace, names are first come, first served. There's nobody in charge. And so what you do is you grab a rest of the name, so what subset of identity is this solving? Just obtaining a name and asserting its key. But getting a unique ID is not a problem. We have lots of unique IDs. We have several email addresses, Twitter handles, usernames at each website, et cetera. Um, uh, and by the way, people think I have a Twitter handle. I do not. Um, early on, um, when Twitter was new, we had to take a class um, when I was at Sun on how to use Twitter, so I did. And part of the class, you had to um, you know, create a handle and send one tweet. So the one tweet I sent, I, I chose the handle Radia Perlman, and the one tweet I sent was, I can't say my life is any more complete now that I know what Twitter is. And I, <laughs> I never sent another one. And then recently, there was a reason why I wanted to log into Twitter, not to send anything, but um, to look at something and you need an account. But um, I didn't remember the password or the password maybe that I chose at that point was no longer a legal one. So my recovery password was my email, ad my e recovery email address was at Sun. And so I, um, you know, sent email to Twitter saying, hey, can you help me? I, I have no access to that. And they said, no, we can't help you. You have to use another, uh, you have to create another thing. So at any rate, if you ever think you can reach me with my Twitter handle, Radio Roman, you can't. Um, so at any rate, um, um, when people say, oh, you know, like, 
the evil monopoly of DNS. Well, it's not really a monopoly because there's like 1,500 top-level domains you can get a name in. Um, and yeah, so names become meaningless strings with this distributed identity thing, even more so than today, which they're really meaningless strings. It doesn't say how to map a DNS name so that you can use DNS to get an IP address once you have one of these things. It does avoid CAs because um, you don't need a certificate, but why not just use your public key as your unique identity? It's um, you know way simpler and less expensive. So it doesn't solve all the things like mapping between a name and what a human wants to talk to, which is also kind of a hole in the current things. And um, getting a, being able to look it up to reach somebody to get the IP address. And one time I was talking about this and I said, it doesn't solve um, what happens if you lose your private key and, um, or whatever other credentials. And um, yeah, what happens if, you, if your private key is stolen or you forget your private key? And someone said, oh, they do have a solution to that. And I said, really? I, I can't imagine. What is it? And he showed me a spec that said, saving the private key is essential. You can't lose it. All access and control will be relinquished. Don't lose a private key, please. <laughs> so the solution is ask users very nicely not to lose their key. <laughs> so people ask me, how can I use blockchain in this application? Or what can I build with blockchain? And I say, no, start with what problem are you solving? Look at various approaches and choose the best, best one. If blockchain happens to be the best one, which I have yet to see, uh, look, you know, do that, but, you know, choose the best one. So um, one time an engineer said to me, well, that sounds good, what you're saying, you know, look at various things and build the best one, but my manager really wants me to use blockchain. So I said, fine, do what I said, you know, look at various alternatives, build the best one, and then tell your manager you're using blockchain. He'll never know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, final rant, always know what problem are you solving. Um, oh, and then this is just, I I'm apologize to people who've heard this story before, but in interconnections, I sometimes have these little boxes that I say real world example, where I try to, um, you know, show a real world thing to illustrate the point I'm making. So for instance, for scalability, I talk about the wine glass clicking protocol, which is fine if you have like four people. But if you have 11 people, everyone has to click everyone else's glass, it, it gets unwieldy. So um, the one example that's everybody's favorite, and it's 100% true, um, um, was to illustrate you should know what problem you're solving before you try to solve it. So when my son was three, he ran up to me crying, holding up his hand, saying, my hand, my hand. So I took it and I kissed it a few times. What's the matter, honey? Did you hurt it? And he said, no, I got pee on it. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs>